Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Most of us have seen movies or television shows where sharks have been portrayed as marauders who prey on unsuspecting swimmers or smaller fish in the sea. But many Wild Kingdom episodes illustrate how sharks and other predators are an important part of the food chain in our underwater world. Oceans cover 70% of our planet, yet we still have much to learn about this important ecosystem. Modern technology has enhanced our ability to study the oceans with minimal disruption to their habitat. Human involvement and recent legislation to protect underwater creatures allow for the resurgence of these many species. There's more good news to come in the Wild Kingdom, so sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. The reefs of the Coral Sea, noted for their beautiful coral formations and teeming with marine life under the tropical sun, become a different world after nightfall. A night dive under artificial light opens to view a world even more abundant in animal life and with colors far more vivid. Lovely by day, the coral reef becomes wholly breathtaking at night. Recently, participating in some nocturnal studies being conducted by researchers from Marine Land of Australia, Tom Allen and I entered this marine world after dark. Although we had caught sea snakes before in the daytime, our objective was to capture two more to determine what physiological changes they undergo at night. A glove is used as partial protection from their highly venomous bites. A nylon net sack is inverted over the arm, and when the desired sea snake is located, it is grasped firmly at about this point and pulled into the bag. Sea snakes are numerous on the reefs about 165 miles off Queensland, Australia, so having begun our voyage here at the docks of Marineland of Australia, we headed for Saumarez Reef, here, to begin our Coral Sea Night Dive. As we near our destination, John Reynolds, Director of Marine Land of Australia, Tom Allen and I are ready for diving. Having arrived, we must leave the Marine Land ship and transfer to a smaller boat. Navigation among the coral reefs must be done with great care, since they can rip apart the hulls of the sturdiest ships. We're heading for a place called Saumarez Reef, which at low tide allows a sandbar to become temporarily exposed. Here we'll take time to spend several minutes inspecting an enormous Liberty ship which ran aground, according to Reynolds, late in the Second World War while attempting to evade enemy submarines. It is obvious that the damage done to this big ship by the coral reef was as severe as any torpedoes. I can't help but agree with John Reynolds and Tom that the forces of nature can sometimes be deadlier than the weapons of war devised by man. But now it's time for us to move on and get to the area of this reef where we'll be making our night dive. The tide rises quickly here, and even though we've only been gone from the outboard boat a short while, already the sandbar on which we put a ground has been covered over. Our 
our boatman, Oliver, lets the boat drift across the bar so the prop of the outboard motor will not be damaged when he starts it. The dive area is several miles from here and we'll pick our way carefully around the coral, arriving there about sunset. We've readied our diving gear and underwater lamps, and with nightfall approaching, it's time to begin. Even though there was a trace of twilight still remaining above, we've entered a heavy darkness here, broken only by the glow of our lanterns and at first a sense of eeriness envelops us in this strange nighttime world. Soon the first coral reef is in view and the eerie feeling passes as we see what an incredible abundance of life forms are around us. They fill the water like a blizzard and we saw nothing to equal it during our daytime dives when evidently they mostly remained hidden. We'll be very careful with this camouflaged stonefish since its spines are very poisonous. Because they're difficult to see, oftentimes they're accidentally stepped upon and venom sacs at the base of each spine injects a poison into the foot that can be extremely dangerous, perhaps even fatal. We will undoubtedly encounter numerous creatures here in the darkness which could be dangerous, so we will remain very cautious. The coral reef is inhabited by many colorful animals such as this unusual and rather rare pencil urchin. It seems that everywhere the light shines there is animal life. A somewhat timid hermit crab has no hard body shell for protection, and so it takes up residence in the first adequate shell it finds on the bottom. The soft, vulnerable body is flexible and muscular and clings firmly to the inner curves of the shell, while the formidable claws act as defense against frontal attack. When the hermit crab grows too large for the shell it has adopted, it simply looks around for another one that is roomier and changes abode. Right now, this one's anxious to get away from our inspection. There's a movement below which John Reynolds has also seen. It's a large black sea snake. Since Tom has the capture bag and is a little way off, we'll just watch this one for now. There are many species of sea snakes, but most of those we've seen in this area have been considerably lighter in color. I've caught a glimpse of movement under a piece of coral. Tom comes to lend a hand since it's hard to know exactly what to expect. It's another sea snake, and this time one of the more familiar tan-colored specimens. These sea snakes, which are related to cobras, have a venom of high toxicity and must be handled with extreme care. The flattened tail allows the sea snake to swim effortlessly but they do have to go to the surface for air to breathe. As a matter of fact, this one is acting now as if it wants to replenish its air supply. So for a few minutes, we'll hold off attempting to capture it. The snake's definitely ready for some fresh air. We'll continue to wait. The sea snake we saw surfaced briefly to replenish its air supply, then turned and swam back down directly toward us. 
We watched with interest as the sea snake returned our way. It doesn't appear to be alarmed by our lights and seems to be an ideal specimen for Tom to capture. Marlin has indicated to me that this would be a good sea snake to use for the physiological study. As soon as the reptile gets relatively clear of the coral and in a more open area, we'll see if we can get it into the bag. These sea snakes are generally pretty docile, but because of the deadliness of their venom, it is never wise to grow overconfident in the handling of them. A close-up look at the captive sea snake does not show any particular difference from those specimens we've caught by daylight, but I'd better get it into the bag, because Marlin is concerned for my safety. Fortunately, they're a lot easier to handle than most of the venomous snakes on land. We'll study this specimen much more closely later on. I'll take the specimen back to the boat and put it into our holding tank there. For now, I'll make some observations around here, following this interesting coral ledge for a little distance. Ever aware of safety, particularly in night dives, John Reynolds positions himself to keep a watchful eye on both of us. Here's one of the more common tropical fish of the Great Barrier Reef. It is certainly one of the most handsome as well. This is the line butterfly fish, and a fairly large one at that. Since the species reaches a maximum growth of only about 12 inches. This is an interesting and unusual animal clinging to the coral. It looks like some weird plant, but it's actually a basket starfish. Closely related to the destructive coral-eating crown of thorns starfish, it moves about over the coral on minute tubular feet equipped with suction discs. There are numerous species of corals which form the Great Barrier Reef, but one of the most splendidly colored is Sarcophyton coral, with its brilliant orange polyps which open only at night. Strange that such soft, flowery-looking animals can leave behind skeletons of such size and hardness that they can crush the hulls of ships which happen to run aground on them. As we've often seen among the coral growths, here's another plant-like animal called Physobrachia anemone. Each of its tentacles has a paralytic sting. A white-lined anemone fish, or amphiprion, lives in a symbiotic relationship with the anemone. Immune from the poisonous stings of the plant-like animal, it can take refuge from other fish within the tentacles. In turn, it lures other fish into reach of the stinging cells where they are stunned, 
then engulfed by the tentacles and slowly devoured. Everywhere one looks among the corals, there is life. Here in a little cranny of a skeletal coral formation, a delicate red and white banded shrimp is a touch of brilliance in the dull cover. It keeps itself reasonably well hidden from predators. Ready in an instant to dart back into the darkest recesses of the cranny should danger threaten. It is unusual to find them in deep water like this, where predatory fish are abundant. A coral cod or leopard fish will normally snap up any shrimp or small fish it encounters. This time it doesn't, evidently having a full stomach already, and now simply curious rather than hungry. It is a beautiful fish with iridescent spotting and the ability to change its background color from deep red to light brown. There's another unusual starfish of the coral reef, this one with appendages which are like plumes and which give it the name of feather starfish. Right now, it's time to rejoin the others and leave alone such species as the highly venomous red firefish. There were still a great many unusual sights for us to see before we set about trying to catch another sea snake. Now that I have rejoined John Reynolds and Tom Allen, we will do a little more observing of the life of the coral reef as we continue to look for another sea snake to go along with the one we've already captured. Though almost anywhere one looks here, there is something alive. Often it is so well camouflaged that unless it moves, it can be missed. This puffer fish moving its mouth as it breathes is an example. It's not only well disguised, but has another defensive facility which it uses when threatened. Since it cannot swim rapidly to escape, it inflates itself enormously with water so that it becomes difficult for another fish to swallow. Swimming near me is a tiny yellow boxfish. This species is the long-nosed boxfish, which is not common in this area of the Coral Sea. It bears a resemblance to the pufferfish, but is not related to that species. We're lucky to see it. It's quite a young one, and as it grows older, will become a plain buff color with brownish spots. Maximum size is about eight inches. There are numerous hazards on the coral reef, most of which can be avoided. But here is one that occasionally surprises and seriously bites even the most careful diver. Well camouflaged in sand, this is a tasseled wabigong, a dangerous shark with a strange network of fleshy lobes on its mouth parts. This shark grows to 10 feet in length and has a fierce array of huge fang-like teeth. Fortunately, the wabigongs are not especially aggressive unless disturbed, and it is wise to leave them alone. Here's a curled up nudibranch, the species called a Spanish dancer. It's one of the most beautiful of creatures in the coral sea. It belongs to the mollusk family and when active moves through the water with a butterfly-like grace. 
This one, however, is evidently not willing to fully arouse itself from its present lethargic state and perform. The name nudibranch means naked gill and refers to its exposed gills. Most of the nudibranchs are smaller and much less colorful than the Spanish dancer, and they have effective ways of protecting themselves. One of the most abundant nudibranchs in tropical seas is the sea hare, which uses protective coloration to disguise itself quite well on corals or vegetation. If that defense fails, it has the ability to emit a cloud of purple ink with irritant properties that discourage would-be attackers. While Tom's been looking at the nudibranchs, I've been on the watch for sea snakes. I've seen beautiful little tropical fish, but the sea snakes are not as active during nighttime as we had anticipated. Fortunately, one of the reptiles has come into range of our lights, but it certainly doesn't appear to be actively seeking prey. I'll keep a close watch until it stops, since it looks as if it's simply hunting for a place to hide among the coral. Looks as if this is where the snake means to stay for a while. Tom and John have caught my signal and they're all ready to make the capture. But it may be that this specimen won't be quite as docile as the one taken earlier. Now that we have the snake safely in the bag, our job is over. It's time we return to our boat and leave the incredible beauty and fascination of this nighttime world of the Coral Sea. Through extensive and sometimes hazardous observation and research, men such as John Reynolds and the scientists of Marine Land of Australia are unlocking many of nature's secrets about marine life. Man knows less about the lives of undersea animals than any other form of life on the globe. Yet, with continually improving techniques of observation and study, we are constantly increasing our knowledge of the creatures which share our world. In the process, we become better able to live in concert with our natural surroundings. Quite as importantly, we more fully realize that for his own survival, Man must strive to protect all portions of the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.